Well, um, it was really nice to hear about the success of the students. I guess being in a university, there cannot be anything nicer to hear about. Um, with that said, um, I'll get with slight introduction of myself. I've been kind of at UCF since the prehistoric ages, joined at 97. In the early days at UCF, I used to be working on miniature engineering systems. And then probably from about mid 2000s, I, uh, we founded the uh, Center for Advanced Turbo Machinery Energy Research with the focus on power generation, aviation and space propulsion, <coughs> turbo machinery and uh, related extreme temperature systems are, are important. Um, now, one thing that I like to point out that our focus have been always on student training and systems. So instead of looking at any one fundamental areas, we look at the whole uh, problem as a system so that we can combine the expertise in say heat transfer flow materials and manufacturing and statistics and other science related disciplines all together to come up with a solution. And that has been our um, plan so far. Now, on the, obviously we cannot do any of that stuff without graduation, uh, without the students that, that, have, that have been working in our labs. And most of my students have gone to OEMs for the reason that uh, Mike and Shane was talking about, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that in the coming slides. But also there are a few that have gone to the universities and, and that kind of all that comes from the fact that we try to focus on um, pretty important topics under Keter. So with that said, I and many of you have seen these slides before. Um, at, in Florida, we are actually pretty fortunate to have a large constellation of related companies. And um, in the area of turbo machinery, uh, you can see all the main names and I'll be coming talking about that in the next slide in a minute. And even, even even the new ones are coming in. For example, Dushan came to Palm Beach Gardens, what, about three or four years ago. And I believe if I have not mistaken, uh, Greg Vogel from Power Systems Manufacturing is online that just got bought over by Hanwa uh, last month. So in other words, people do think Florida as a destination for this kind of uh, industry. And that is the people that know what happens in Florida. So if I kind of think of all the turbo machinery related companies and also those that employ those, meaning Florida has got an awesome record. Uh, the ones in bold are probably present in bigger, in more more uh, in depth than the ones light, but there are only two of those. And, and if I'm a student anywhere in the world or I'm a researcher, meaning there could not be any better place to be located than Florida. And, and in Florida, I guess no better place than UCF to be doing this kind of stuff. So that pretty much focused, or that pretty much guided our interest in what we should be looking at. As I said, we look at, we, we approach everything from a systems point of view, and the current big system trends that are happening are hypersonics, decarbonization, um, supercritical carbon dioxide power cycle, digital twin, uh, non-fossil fuels for power and propulsion and things like that. And, and, Today's talk, I'll be kind of focusing on the decarbonizations and a little bit on digital twin, kind of as a segue for what uh, Mike and Shane was talking in the previous talk. So now I'll start with this page. Um, and everybody, anyone can look into this emissionindex.org. And that is what uh, Shane and Mike were talking about. This is. Um, created by Carnegie Mellon University. And this is tracking carbon generation uh, per unit electricity produced from 2000 onwards. Now you see that it is from 2000 onwards, not like 2010, not when renewables started really entering the market. So long before renewables became important, the carbon produced or carbon dioxide produced per unit electricity was going down. Of course, you, one may say that the slope has accelerated a little bit, but that the main reason for that is coal power plants are being replaced by 
natural gas power plants because it works both in the economics efficiency and whichever way you can think of it. And of course, the availability of natural gas that has driven the early days of this going um, progression downwards. Now, one may say, well, then that is good, right? Because you may draw whatever curve you want to do and very soon we'll be reaching zero. Well, there is a problem there. And if you look at this, uh, let me put my, um, if you look at the green um, boxes on the, on the right, on the, on the lower right hand corner, let me see. Um, is my screen visible? It's changed. Yes, it is visible. Okay, so if you look at the the um, the green um, bars on the lower right hand corner, those are US and Americas and the Europe, and you see that they have re reduced the the amount of coal consumption has gone down exactly the way the graph on the left is uh, talking about. But one thing to notice that whatever decrease that may have been over the last uh, decades or so, three decades or so, the increase in the Asia Pacific area more than uh, overwhelmed that. Then the question is why that is so. So now the question is why really that happened. So in order to really explain why that is happening is that, let me take a couple of slides from one of the mine presentations that happened in March and I'll be telling a little bit of that in the next uh, picture. Well, if I look at the upper right hand corner pic graph, I can see that uh, per capita electricity consumption um, as, a, as correlated with per capita GDP. And is, we see that there's a pretty decent correlations between the two, although there are some outliers, but the correlation is pretty decent. Now, if I look at the lower right hand uh, graph, and if you if, just let me explain what it is. If I follow the USA line, that is basically what is the number for USA in 2010. And this graph kind of uh, follows through what happened in USA over the years. Now, what you see as these vertical lines is in 2010, where the individual countries are um, located in 2010, in as opposed to the USA curve over the year. For example, uh, if I Look at China, for example, the value for China in 2010 kind of lines up what happened in USA in 1960 timeframe. So we can actually divide up the whole domains into three group of countries. One is the advanced countries. And that is where the, the main driving force is socio-political uh, consciousness and potentially the higher efficiency usage of energy. So, and, and we see that the growth is slightly downwards. Now, in this case, if somebody is lower, that does not necessarily mean that they are not yet as advanced. That may mean that uh, the, they use energy more efficiently. Now, if we look into the middle portion, that is where 4.2 billion of the world's people are located. We see that there is a huge growth on the upward direction. And that is what really driving this large yellow portion, the growth in the Asia Pacific region. And we cannot really forget about that. But at this point, I'll actually point out something in kind of shameless advertisement for what we do. Um, so MIND, if you're wondering what is that, MIND is the monthly industry networking day. We had two of those. The very first one was in March given by Mr. Dave Walsh. Obviously, everybody at Mitsubishi and at UCF know him very well. And the second second one was given by uh, Mr. Rich Burberg, the president, current president of the Siemens Energy. And we'll be updating you as we go forward with the upcoming uh, events. But now coming back to the technical portion. So that is one part we have to keep in mind. The next part that we have to keep in mind that decarbonization is just not for the power sector. It's for the entire entire economy. For example, you see where the carbon comes from by sector. Well, power is important, transport is important, and that is where a lot of work is being done um, as we are having renewables and ele electric vehicles. But industry sector is not necessarily negligible either. And, and then, of course, there'd be buildings. 
So with all this said, question is what would be the potential future opportunities for us researchers to look at? Well, since because of this large yellow portion where my pointer is, that growth may not be really coming down very quickly and know that every power plant has got probably 40, 50 years of life, carbon capture utilization and sequestration, this has to be come up uh, in a very cheap, efficient and, and, and cost effective way. Now people say that, can say that this has been tried and this is expensive, but well, same used to be said about photovoltaic cells, right? Then, then alternative sources of chemical agents. For example, one part of the industry sector is steel industry and steel industry uses a lot of carbon for, for, for a reduction of the steel and we need to have other agents so that we do not have to use carbon. Then sources of process heat and other, other areas of research that would be very important to make sure the entire economy is being decarbonized at the same way and the entire world is being decarbonized because we cannot put up a wall in the sky to avoid carbon dioxide coming over to Western world. With that said, I'll kind of go over very quickly of three projects that uh, we are working on in kind of response to that list that we saw in the last page. Um, one of them is, uh, this one is funded by Department of Energy. Here we are trying to come up with new alternatives for uh, hydrogen storage. And we are, instead of using liquid or pressurized storages, we are using physical adsorption on materials called aerogels. And this is an active project in partnership with Southwest Research, EL Liquid, NASA Kennedy, and Turbine Technology Services as one of the uh, asset owner where we like to apply this. Then the next uh, one that I like to point out, remember I mentioned about uh, industry sector, one of the largest uh, culprit in the industry sector is cement industry and, and the steel industry. So for example, we teamed up with a university in, in um, uh, India and, and a, a cement plant, which is basically part of Lafarge whole Seam, which is a global international cement corporation, production corporation. And this is the, what you see on the right side is the kind of layout of where the heat is being produced. So we kind of went through the whole process, try to understand where is the heat being thrown out to the atmosphere and also where uh, carbon-based uh, reactants are being used. So we need to really make the whole plant green and we are working towards that. At this point, we are looking into some lower grade heat that could be converted to electricity by the help of what we call supercritical carbon dioxide power cycle. And last but not the least, as the, the whole power sector is getting green, the tomorrow's power sector would be very complex. Uh, we are going to have electric grid, obviously, and we would be having hydrogen and oxygen storage. Remember, when we do electrolysis and produce a green hydrogen, we also get green oxygen too. And what we do with the oxygen? Now, in order to do the electrolysis, we also have to, we also need water. And this amount of water that is necessary is no joke. And one can do the calculations and see that we need a huge amount of water supply for producing green hydrogen. So in other words, um, I see that in the immediate future, there could be three or four grids, the electric grid, the water grid or water storage, the uh, lithium ion storage, obviously that kind of helps for long short term storage, but then also the hydrogen and or hydrogen oxygen storage, but we'll not be burning them immediately. So we also need the natural gas supply and all these have to interact with each other to make the supply the electricity to our houses and the offices. And that would call for a pretty complex digital twin architecture where we may have a plant model, but the plant model can, has to be looked at by anomaly, some kind of machine learning, artificial intelligence type of approach to work on the data. But as we'll be finding out, that is not, would not be enough because these systems are pretty well behaved. And as a result, there are not too many examples of failures that, that are there to train the artificial intelligence models. So we'll be needing physics-based model, low order physics-based model to kind of compare continuously the database model. And that would be triggering action. And the action could go to some kind of lookup table and say, hey, we have got some aging happening. Aging will always happen. Question is, can we 
Can we catch that and can we update the model continuously? And tomorrow's digital twin must be able to do that. And actually, for example, this does not have to be just for the um, power plants, but also for uh, MRO, the maintenance repair overhaul for the airplanes and other capital systems. Now that we lost some time, I'll probably try to end up here with the last slide. Well, at the end, nothing in the university happens without the students. So we have to acknowledge first their contribution and the current students, as well as the past students, as well as my colleagues. And also very recently, um, we, are, we are striking collaboration with physics and math. And I thought that Professor Rahman's group is present online and we are working with them on the, on the, on the physical adsorption process. Um, and with that, I will end my talk.